I'm Aaron Woodrick. And I'm Chris Sims. And this is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. On today's episode, we're going to talk about military procurement and why the current approach has been such a huge waste of taxpayer money and how much the Trudeau government spent on its failed bid for a seat on the UN Security Council. But before we get to that, we just wanted to touch on a story that actually has for once a not too bad ending for taxpayers. And it has to do, of all things, with Member of Parliament's lunches in Ottawa. Last week, a parliamentary committee was talking about its own budget, and incredibly, basically everyone in the committee from every party decided that it didn't make sense to be spending money on catered lunches when most MPs were attending committee via Zoom. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I think it might surprise most Canadians that members of parliament actually get catered free lunches, and it's not just in committee either. No, they can also get a free lunch in the lobby next to the House of Commons chamber. And they're also allowed to claim a per diem or daily amount to cover the cost of lunch uh, and dinner if they're working. But I still think this committee decision is a baby step in the right direction. Here's Conservative MP Corey Tucker. I I would make the motion that we remove the free lunches. Someone has to pay, it's the taxpayer. There's people going bankrupt across Canada. And we're talking about free lunches for parliamentarians. Now there's some unusual common sense there recognizing that it's just a bad look for MPs to be getting free lunches right now while some people are losing their shirts. Exactly. And I think it would also surprise a lot of taxpayers uh, that members of parliament, when they're in Ottawa, they're technically on the clock. So they're working, even though they have homes with fridges and everything, since they're in Ottawa and away from home and working, they can claim that per diem. And another comment from the same committee that made me raise my eyebrow, this time it comes from Conservative MP Tom Lukiski. Listen to this. There are many, many, many MPs that have lunches at committees, lunches in the lobby, and still claim the full per diem. You are supposed to, by the rules, if you have a lunch in the lobby, eliminate that lunch from your daily per diem. So here is an MP suggesting that there are a number of MPs that not only eat the free lunches, but they're also claiming the per diem, which means they're double dipping. And that's obviously inappropriate. I think a lot of people would ask why we're paying for MP lunches at all. After all, these people get their travel expenses paid, their housing expenses paid, they get a salary of $180,000 a year. It's quite a good package. Uh, But if they're going to get their lunches paid for, they should not be double dipping. Yeah, and it goes further than that sometimes. It borders on the ridiculous. Uh, When I was a reporter on Parliament Hill, I attended committee a lot in person, and I actually saw an MP from the prairies stuffing his blazer pockets full of vegetables and sandwiches and cookies and stuff. It was one of the weirdest things I had ever seen. And it's really outrageous uh, to see that some folks are double dipping. But I guess the only good news is the committee did vote unanimously to suspend these lunches until the regular in-person meetings are zoomed so it's not forever but it's good at least for now yeah like i said baby steps are still steps yeah. uh, especially since uh you know watching this committee it was uh, it was actually remarkable that mps were getting along for once they almost never <laughs> agree on anything and if the one thing they can agree on is that they should be cutting some of their own perks then maybe that's not a bad thing uh and it might finally mean that they're they're just getting the message that there's a lot of canadians out there having such a hard time right now believing that we're all in this together Uh, if members of parliament themselves aren't making any sacrifices. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Speaking of sacrifices, didn't they get a pay hike this year? That kind of blew my mind. Yeah, they did. Uh, To be fair, it was an automatic tax hike. It's not like they decided in the middle of pandemic to give themselves a raise. But we actually contacted every MP and asked them if they, they would donate their pay raise. And more than 200 out of 338, including MPs from every party, agreed to donate their pay raise to charity. So I thought we thought that was a nice gesture. It doesn't go quite far enough again. We think that uh, they should actually be taking a pay cut, if anything. That's a really good idea. How much do you think that cut should be at the federal level? Yeah, well, we can look at what other politicians in other countries are doing. I mean, in Japan and India, they, the MPs there took 20 and 30% pay cuts. Or you could go with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's one of his BFFs down in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. Uh, She came out very early in the pandemic and said uh, she was going to take a pay cut of 20%. And she was going to do it, in her words, for leadership and solidarity. So there's an example right there for Mr. Trudeau to follow if he's willing to do it. 
Yeah, here in BC, actually, uh, we just finished a big election and uh, Premier John Horgan was reelected and he just named his new cabinet and we wanted him to show leadership and in solidarity with the working people of BC. And we asked him to name a smaller cabinet this time around and to reduce their pay. So their top pay by 15%. Unfortunately, he did neither. We actually have a bigger cabinet now, and so far there's been no salary reduction. But hopefully they will smarten up and will actually start making some real sacrifices at the political level. But it is nice to have even a sliver of good news coming out of Ottawa these days in the form of no more free lunches. Stay tuned. Next up is Deep Dive, where I'll be joined by Renaud Brossard, our Quebec director, to talk about military procurement and how it can be improved to get better planes and ships while saving taxpayers money. Welcome to Deep Dive. This is a part of the show where we dive deeper into important issues of the day. I'm Renaud Broussard, our, uh, the CTF's Quebec director, and joining me today is Aaron Woodrick, our federal director. You're joining us today because you've got some stories about military procurement, such as buying fighter jets and Navy ships, and why the way the government's doing this is costing us billions of dollars more than it should. Yeah, it's interesting because the military has to buy a lot of things, in some cases very big things, and you think they'd be pretty good at it by now. But it turns out they're not. And just to give you one real sort of staggering example, did you know that our military is actually still using some pistols from the 1940s? Oh, no, you can't be serious. Yeah, I didn't believe it either, but it's true. There was a plan to replace these pistols Way back in 2011, when they were only 50 or 60 years old instead of 60 or 70 years old, it ended up getting scrapped because there were just too many requirements attached to the deal. One of those conditions was that the guns had to be made in Canada. So the military has been stuck with these pistols from the Second World War era. And now there's a finally a new process underway that'll hopefully see them get those new guns by 2022. And, and as for the price, we still have no idea what it'll cost. That's unbelievable. But I'm guessing this is not the only thing the government has bungled when it comes to military procurement. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not. And with guns, you're talking millions of dollars. When it comes to really big things like fighter jets and ships for the Navy, the price tag that we're talking about now is often tens of billions of dollars. From the gun example, I'm guessing it doesn't always go well. But please tell me we're not still using planes and ships from the 1940s. <laughs> They're not quite that old, but they're still pretty old, as I'll get to in a minute. But for a long time, I, the point I want to explore is that we've seen attempts to buy these things uh, and they drag on and everyone ends up losing. So the military doesn't get their, their guns or planes or ships for years, if at all. And the taxpayers end up paying way more money than they expect to at the beginning. That sounds like a terrible deal for everyone, but can you give us a couple more examples? Why not start with the Air Force? Fighter jets, is, it's another sad story, and the cost is pretty staggering. The Air Force, they have a fleet of 40-year-old jets called CF-18s, and the process to replace them goes back at least 20 years when they started uh, thinking about ways to replace them. Ten years ago, the Harper government actually had a deal in place to buy 65 uh, F-35s, and that was going to cost $9 billion dollars. But the process got bogged down in politics and stalled. And the Auditor General did a audit and concluded that they were actually going to cost $19 billion instead of $9 billion. And then the Liberals came to power in 2015. They killed the deal. And now we're back to square one. They're once again looking for new jets. And it's a safe bet that whatever they do end up landing on, it's certainly going to cost more than $19 billion. Let me get this straight. The Air Force has no new planes. And taxpayers have to pay even more in the end. And on top of that, they have to pay for maintaining the old planes. That has to be like the worst example of any deal in the history of deal making. Yeah, you would think the Navy might have a contender for that one. They've been trying to get new supply ships built for years. And the Parliamentary Budget Office actually just released a report showing that they have two separate programs to get ships. One of them is coming in, believe it or not, on time and on budget. The other one is, to be charitable, not. I, at this point, I'm just surprised that something the government has done was delivered on time and on budget. That seems just so unusual. It's sad that it is unusual, but you're right. And here's what happened. A few years back, when the Navy realized it needed supply ships, they needed two supply ships for each coast, the government had a competition to see who could build them. But rather than just give the work to the shipyard that could build the best ships at the best price, they decided to just spread the work around. That seems like a really common thing governments do, but let me play devil's advocate here, because this is an argument we hear quite a lot. Shouldn't governments focus on creating jobs in every local community instead of just going for one? 
What do you, what would be your counter argument to that? Yeah, I would say that the counter to that is that's not the point of procurement. So it's a problem. The point of shipbuilding, for example, it's not to create jobs in this or that town or province or region. It's to build the best ships at the best price for the Navy. And when you start to try and focus on spreading it around, uh, this is partly how you end up with these huge delays and cost overruns. The PBO noted that the, the ship built, it was actually a ship that was converted um, by a shipyard in Quebec City called Davy. That ship was built on time and on budget. And they're also offering to do a second ship, which is probably something the government should look at. But meanwhile, the ships that were commissioned to a different builder in Vancouver, they're still not ready. And the price differential is a lot. Okay, but what exactly is a lot? Is it 10 million, 100 million? According to the PBO's estimate, the buying two converted ships from Davy, that'll cost about 1.4 billion. Whereas the two uh, ships from C-SPAN in Vancouver, those are going to cost 4.4. So that's more than triple the price for two ships. That's an incredible waste of money, especially given the kind of deficits the federal government is running. Uh, it, it brings to mind this quote from a Quebec politician from a couple of years ago who said, just because we can pay for a billion dollar project doesn't mean we can pay for a four billion dollar project, nor that we should pay for a four billion dollar project. Yeah, that's a good point. And these examples we've talked about, there's just that's just a few of them. That's just scratching the surface. But it just shows how problematic it is when you start to uh, hand out these really big contracts for reasons for anything other than best value for money. And we know governments should never be wasting money. But right now, uh, in particular, the government needs to look for savings anywhere it can. And if they can save billions of dollars on these kinds of big ticket items, they really should. It's time for Waste Watch. That's when we make fun of the dumb things that our politicians are wasting our tax dollars on. So, Franco, what have you got for us today? Oh, I got a good one. You remember uh, Trudeau's failed United Nations Security Council bid? Yeah, Trudeau announced his plans to campaign for a seat back in 2016. And this June, we found out that Trudeau's failed UN campaign cost us at least $2.4 million. Yeah, we ended up coming third with 108 votes. So, Doing some quick back of the envelope math, that's uh, taxpayers paying $23,000 for each vote. On a failed campaign. Franco, $2.4 million is a lot of money <laughs> to be wasting. That's $2.4 million bucks that we could have just flushed down the toilet, essentially. But you say that the failed bid cost at least $2.4 million. So is there more? That's correct. That $2.4 million doesn't account for staff time. And knowing government, I think it's safe to say that would be a big part of the total bill. And it also doesn't count for all of the travel costs. And I could just imagine all the flying around the feds had to do to try to win over the hearts and minds of the United Nations. Weeks leading up to COVID-19, Trudeau was flying to places like Munich, Dakar, Addis Ababa to lobby for UN votes. So travel costs would clearly be substantial. It sounds like Trudeau was quite the globetrotter during his campaign for a UN Security Council seat. And yeah, Jasmine, I think you're touching on a very important point. It must be nice to travel to all these fancy places, lobby all these bigwigs, all in the taxpayer dime. Sounds like a great job if, if you can get it. Now, we don't know all of the expenses and exactly what they went into, but we do know some of the partial expenses that have been released on this. And let me just list a few here. So we got $310,000. So bureaucrats could campaign on a full-time basis at the United Nations. Eh, then there was $70,000 on hospitality expenses. Yeah, I hear there's definitely some fancy restaurants in New York. There was also $31,000 in flight costs to fly diplomats to New York. Good to know that the federal government is really concerned about that air pollution. And last but certainly not least... $20,000 was spent for consultants and contractors. As if we weren't paying the bureaucrats enough money, we needed consultants too. And just a reminder, these aren't all the expenses, just what we know so far. It's crazy to think of what taxpayers are paying for here. But another thing to remember is the amount of government resources, even just in terms of time, that went into this failed UN Security Council campaign. Trudeau announced the bid four years ago in 2016. His Minister of Foreign Affairs apparently had over 100 meetings and various phone calls about the bid. So think of all of those bureaucrat hours spent lobbying for a seat or Trudeau spending his time campaigning. Taxpayers pay a lot of money for ministers and the prime minister and bureaucrats. So I think it's safe to say that there were way better ways that they could have been spending their time. Yeah, totally agree. Even though that's probably 
an understatement. But for our listeners out there, as I'm sure we're going to have more on this, we asked our investigative journalist, James Wood, to file a ton of freedom of information requests to find out exactly what hospitality expenses taxpayers were paying for. We're going to find out. We're bureaucrats whining and dining the UN on our expense. Stay tuned for that. Well, that's our show for this week. Thank you all for tuning in. And thanks to our colleague, James Wood, for all his fine work putting this together. For sure. And if you liked this podcast and you know somebody that wants more accountable government and less waste, send this to them and be sure to subscribe. Catch you next week. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening. And thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.